Yeah, first I, um, um, I owe an apology to the natives, to the um, natives in the audience, the ones who were listening to recently to my other uh, public talks. Uh, despite the, um, uh, despite the, um, uh, the title, it is still the same talk about knowledge society and uh, human capital. But uh, I, 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 did, uh, I did make an effort to add some original spins and emphases. Um, so I hope it will be still uh, worth, your, uh, worth your time. Um, I would like to start with the, with the general uh, competitiveness uh, um, uh, problem of Europe. Uh, with the question, how, um, at, wha at what historical point and why competitiveness suddenly becomes such a such a problem uh, on, on the one hand and such a political obsession uh, uh, um, for uh, for European institutions or institutions of European Union that they feel uh, towards the end of the 90s or throughout the, the 90s. Um, uh, feel such an urge to introduce all, all kinds of not not immediately measures, but let's say long-term strategies to to uh, to increase uh, European European competitiveness in general um, on all levels of uh, say production uh, that is in industry, in uh, education, in in culture, in. Um, provision of, of, of public services. So there is, there is a sense, let's say, um, in the 90s uh, throughout the Europe that Europe is not, not uh, competitive enough and it has to improve as a whole and its, um, its uh, member states and its uh, uh, individual sectors of its economy have to all increase the, uh, the in competitiveness. And in, uh, let's say, in mainstream literature and in the, also in the official political declarations, um, especially from the, from the European Co Commission, but also by uh, national governments adopting this uh, uh, general uh, European perspective st uh, strategies to increase uh, um, competitiveness, uh, you, can, you can read basically uh, two reasons. One is the rise of East Asian, uh, East Asian uh, tigers on the one hand, their, uh, their level of uh, technological development of, uh, and sophistication, which makes existing uh, European uh, technology uh, obsolete or at least a little, bit, uh, a little bit underdeveloped. And then on the one hand and on the other hand, uh, the rise of China and its supply of, of cheap labor which is supposed to, in the globalized world, exert a downward pressure on wages also, also uh, in Europe. And one which is already obsolete but was very uh, prominent in the 90s was the uh, um, so-called new economy uh, boom um, uh, in, the, in the United States. So a short, a short period of intensive uh, um, economic growth based on the investment in the new information technologies, um, in the development of internet uh, business and, uh, and uh, so on. So what does this um, official political pronouncement and mainstream literature uh, focuses exclusively on threats to European competitiveness framed as external shocks? Uh, to which uh, the European economy and, and uh, social policy uh, has, to, uh, has to adjust, which is a, a kind of a mode of thinking that uh, I term globalist opportunism or globalist conformism. Uh, basically, uh, this, uh, this very simplified argument, now we live in a globalized world, we cannot make any decisions on our own, we have to follow the global trends and glo uh, I mean, we would like to keep a, a European social model and the high level of, of social rights, but unfortunately, you know how it is in China, our hands are tied. We have to uh, cut on, let's say, cut on the welfare institutions and so on. Um, but what, um, what is omitted in all this, uh, um, in, in this type of discourse are the internal uh, reasons uh, for the decline of uh, European competitiveness, and this is what I will uh, focus on, on 
um, on, on this part that is on internal uh, contradictions of European industrial and uh, monetary, monetary policy. And in these perspectives, uh, the period of 90s was a period of uh, destruction of a, a large part of, uh, of industrial base that is selective, um, we could call it selective deindustrialization in certain parts of Europe or certain parts of, uh, um, uh, especially, especially in Eastern Europe, that is in, in countries that, that would um, join the European Union much later in this, in this, uh, um, this big extension of membership, but we're in the 90s going through the, this first phase of, of uh, post-socialist transition, which involved the privatization and essentially a destruction of a majority of their uh, industrial um, productive uh, capacities, um, especially in heavy industry, that uh, like in steel industry, in, in shipbuilding, in, um, in coal mining, um, and so on. And this, uh, this was also a process where um, to solve, uh, to solve the potential competitive threat that, let's say, inclusion of the Eastern European uh, industry could present to, uh, to Western European industry with this process of European uh, reun reunion and uh, integration, to solve this internal contradiction of um, Eastern industry uh, presenting potential, uh, as it would, let's say, adjust to market economy, uh, as it would develop, uh, it could potentially present a competitive threat to, uh, at the time, more, more developed and stronger Western European uh, um, uh, um, industry. So to resolve this internal contradiction, there was a process of very simple and straightforward uh, process of buying out and destroying large parts of this uh, industrial base. So to solve this internal contradiction, European Union uh, destroyed a lot of uh, competitive potential for its industry uh, as a whole. Um, to, so basically to prevent a competitive threat to just uh, one half of its industry, it destroyed its uh, competitive potential. Uh, looking at the European industry industry as a whole, there was also parallel to this uh, process, which was very pronounced and very very visible uh, in the 90s. There was also a parallel um, destruction of in in post socialist state of small uh, small scale uh, commerce of small private uh, commercial uh, um, uh, commercial enterprises by big uh, department store uh, uh, multinationals or, or chains um, by the method of, uh, by the method of uh, price dumping. So they, they could enter uh, these newly opened economies, establish new department store and keep prices artificially low until all the local small commercial enterprises went out of, uh, went out of business. And there was also a less pronounced and less visible but also important uh, distra uh, destruction of uh, this typical, at least in uh, Yugoslavia, this typical decentralized cultural production. For example, it took merely a couple of years uh, for, for all the um, city cinemas uh, uh, in Ljubljana to go out of business in favor of one huge uh, cinema, cinema, commercial cinema multiplex on, in the, in the, in the uh, suburbs. So all, this, um, all of these processes combined amounted to shrinking uh, industrial base and, and, uh, and volume of output. And at the same time, so from the late 90s on, um, with the especially with the introduction of Euro, uh, there was imposition of this uh, rigid, rigid uh, um, monetary policy. Um, we heard in the, in the previous lectures, uh, I won't go into details about the European um, arrangements of the European monetary policy, uh, just suffice it to say that um, explicit goal was to, to create a strong, a strong united currency which values to be kept, uh, kept high at any cost. Um, to enter for Euro to enter the, the global uh, global game of becoming uh, competing with dollar to be um, a global uh, reserve reserve uh, currency, which had the deleterious effects on the price competitiveness of European export goods. That is goods which are being exported outside of the 
outside of the uh, uh, eurozone with the introduction of, of um, high value uh, of common currency of euro with high value they would automa automatically be uh, less competitive uh, considering their uh, their price in the international uh, in, in international uh, trade um, so I think this, this are, uh, these are uh, very important and um, a lot of time overlooked internal internal shocks or internal reasons for the drop in uh, European competitiveness and the strategies that emerged at the end of the 90s. End of the 90s was also a time of launching of Lisbon strategy of Bologna reform of comprehensive uh, reform of European uh, uh, research field. Um, and they were all strategies that were launched um, without paying any regard to the processes uh, of selective industrialization that I just described. And they, they were, these strategies was, were in a way um, aimed at um, uh, compensating for the drop of competitiveness caused, uh, caused by this very violent industrial policy uh, in the 90s without touching uh, the, the industrial or monetary policy itself. So there were a way to, to bypass, to, to leave the monetary industrial arrangement as they were, but to introduce some new, me new measures in completely different field and try to restore competitiveness, especially in the, in the area of higher education uh, and, and research. So the, the, the big proclamation um, uh, which you probably all know um, on the on the first page of the of the Lisbon strategy is that Europe is to become uh, the most competitive knowledge based uh, knowledge based society in the world. So it was a um, it was a proposal for measures to uh, to reform education, to reform research and uh, scientific field to compensate for the drop of uh, competitiveness which had its origins uh, in recent reason sensor and the other the other uh, important measure from the Lisbon strategy was the uh, emphasis on the flexibility of the labor market so basically the the costs of com the social costs of competitiveness were shifted to to the working class on the one hand and to educational system uh, um, on, on the on the other hand, um, and then there were also uh, proposals for the development of high tech industry, which could uh, potentially rival the the Eastern Asian ones, and also related to the to the Bologna reform and reforms of the higher education space. There was a launch of a strategy, uh, um, as a part um, a partial strategy for skill upgrading and human capital um, investment. Uh, to to have uh, better qualified uh, for Europe to have better qualified uh, labor force in in the in the future. So now now we'll just briefly um, pay some attention to these measures in turn, but I will mostly focus on the changes in the higher education and uh, research space. Regarding uh, flexibility of the of the labor market. Um, effects of this strategy, uh, social effects of this strategy to raise competitiveness are pretty straightforward. Uh, they result in a downward pressure on wages and the upward, upward pressure um, on working hours. So they, they result, they are very visible and felt by everybody who has any contact with the contemporary European labor market. They result in the intensification of work in longer hours and the uh, uh, stagnating or, or lowering lowering uh, um, um, paying conditions, but its goal is also at least its declared goal is also to uh, to increase productivity. So we have a parallel process to uh, to that which is in in business literature usually described as lean production on the level of industry as a whole. So basically to to cut and uh, reduce any, any non-value adding activity within the, the production process uh, um, and to outsource as much as non-value adding activities outside of the, of the core firm. We have a, we have a similar process rega regarding work expenditure of, uh, of work in, in production. So um, uh, flexibilization also means an attempt to uh, uh, basically a tailorist attempt to, to 
um, to reduce and cut any any unnecessary time and money spent spent on labor, just to make it as efficient as possible for for production to be to be productivity to be uh, to be as high as possible. And generally speaking, social effect of, of flexibilization of the European labor market is a deadlock for the European uh, European working classes in in general. Uh, they're put in a position. Uh, in a position of blackmail or, or extortion, they are offered worsening of their working and living condition as a prerequisite or as a condition to stay afloat in a global competitive uh, in a global uh, competitive uh, um, race. Um, as far as the development of high tech industry uh, um, um, is is uh, uh, concerned is probably uh, too early to tell how how successful. Uh, has this um, uh, has this strategy been? Maybe maybe I could just uh, at this point um, the the problem with the, uh, let's say the imitation of the high tech boom of the United States in in the 90s is that the biggest uh, consumer of information and uh, communication technology is is precisely the financial sector. So basically, with the with the crisis with the uh, with the crisis and the, uh, let's say um, the, the diminishing, uh, diminishing uh, social and, and public trust in the in the financial sector, uh, there there could be trouble on the on the demand side of the realization of all this uh, of all this um, uh, production of information and uh, communication technological uh, appliances. Um, one of, one of the interesting effects of this, let's say, increased production of the. Um, information and communication technology is that um, it's already showing signs of, of overproduction so there is now a European wide attempt to, to force uh, the, the governments or specific public institutions to buy out this excessive capacity of, of um, informational, informational appliances for example to force, uh, to force public schools or public university to excessively digitalize to buy to buy even more computers or a touchpad uh, blackboards and and uh, so on um, and uh, this is just uh, let's say in passing but now to, more to my main point the, the strategy to to um, establish establish knowledge society um, it is it is multi it is a complex and multi-layered uh, process one is already mentioned uh, uh, Bologna reform, which is aimed at uh, transformation of the of the teaching part of the of the university, so um, to um, to reform the the studying itself as a, as a process, and also to reform the relations between uh, between uh, students and professor. Now, regarding Bologna reform, we could be mean and say that it failed even by its own standards, but this is not. Uh, what, uh, what I'm interested in, but uh, more of a um, more of a question in what was Bologna reform successful, even though um, it had it had very very apparent, very visible uh, fails due to technical or uh, administratorial uh, um, incompetence um, and and so on. Um, so, what does Bologna Bologna reform? Uh, beyond these declared very very noble goals of increasing student mobility, bringing the bringing the, the students and professor closer together, facilitate exchange and ideas, which are noble causes uh, in itself. But what does it actually amount to? Is the standardization of the of the study study process, um, uh, which is which is a very very basic um, uh, capitalist very basic capitalist um, procedure for every for every um, activity for every type of work that does not take commodity form as it is standardization is a necessary condition for it to be transformed in a labor as however fictitious uh, uh, commodity so uh, basically what Bologna reform inter introduces is a standardization of, of uh, uh, learning programs by by their lower uh, lowest common denominator, which of course means automatically a sharp drop in in quality of this learning or uh, um, studying studying uh, um, programs. 
and um, and the centralization of the decision making so the uh, so that um, decision making is no longer decentralized among uh, different nation states and different universities or uh, university like institutions within them but but is uh, it's becoming more and more centralized um, by the by the dictate of the needs of the standardization itself so for um, for uh, for a standardization to be successful you, you have to have one center of the, of decision making which dictates the the very criteria of of uh, um, standardization and also standardization is um, is also apparent in the in the research or uh, scientific scientific uh, field proper especially it's been even more pronounced in the in the recent years with the plan uh, for the united european research area which is a, a kind of an implementation of uh, common market principles to the to the uh, to the uh, research uh, research uh, uh, field and uh, social effects of this type of, of standardization and centralization in the research field are the um, immediate effects are um, increasing inequality uh, between between salaries so there's an inner rise of inner inequality between different teachers and a uh, and, uh, pressure to, to destroy the, the system of, of uh, university teachers as public employees, which they traditionally they are in Europe, and to, to push the star system of wages so they are, that they would be paid in a competitive way, in, in permanent competition with another, and according to the levels of their excellent excellence, which is again standardized, this criteria of excellence is again standardized, and measures quantitatively by uh, by gathering uh, academic points by publishing uh, in high rated um, high high rated uh, journals and regarding uh, regarding working conditions within the research and also academic space uh, in general there is a process uh, of proletarization of work or workers going on or wha what we could call a, a real subsumption of, of research and, and teaching teaching uh, work basically the breaking of let's say traditional uh, ways ways of teaching traditional ways of the organization of the of the universities and also traditional hierarchies or at least establishment of of parallel if not uh, utter destruction of these traditional ways this establishment of parallel hierarchies based on the more of the financial and uh, business achievement than on um, intellectual intellectual achievement and also what real subsumptions real subsumption of labor under capital means anywhere not just in the university it means a direct intervention of, of capital as a social relation of the organization of the of the work and the production in the university and, and research field and there is also another not so direct social uh, effect is a change perception of the university so if university is traditionally or the, in this let's say classical Humboldtian perspective seen as the uh, institution that develops general uh, general uh, human knowledge now the, now the perspective shifts to a university as an institution that secures condition of increased productivity and thus, thus uh, um, competitiveness. And to achieve that, and this is also pronounced in, in all of these reform strategies and papers, to achieve increased competitiveness for the European society in general, universities must themselves uh, um, become competitive. And in this, in this regard, um, um, with the introduction of, of uh, with the, not, not yet an introduction, but just the announcement of budget cuts to happen in higher education in Slovenia, uh, uh, rectors, reply rectors of University in Ljubljana was very, very symptomatic in, in this regard. Um, it showed that, uh, that the leadership of the University of Ljubljana has already adopted this, this new this new definition definition of university as an institution that secures condition of, of increased productivity and competitiveness because his argumentation in the letter of protest against austerity measures was um, basically uh, um, 
that if you cut if you cut our funding you will cut your own competitiveness in the future so basically to 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 criticize austerity measures he had no uh, let's say and this is just symptomatic for the disorientation let's say of university leadership everywhere uh, in Europe so the only way they can they can uh, resist or criticize uh, budget cuts is is a cut everywhere else but not us because without us he will no longer be be competitive um, or at least he will not become uh, um, competitive in the future so within this new definition of of university in uh, with this reframing of university as an institution that secures uh, productivity and thus competitiveness, uh, there is a twofold uh, process which is expected to yield uh, um, productivity gains. One one is on the technological side or in Marxist term on the side of of, of constant capital. Um, this is this is the reforms of the research area or the research field are aimed to to increase the total productivity of, of constant capital by way of, of uh, technological uh, technological innovation and uh, um, this is also a part of this this is one of the flagship initiatives within the strategy Europe uh, 2020 is the innovation union and immediate social effect of this uh, of this type of measure is that uh, private industry gets gets directly involved in the um, in setting of research agendas. So research agendas are no longer autonomous in any in any uh, sensible way, but uh, private sector or private industry gets immediately involved in setting the agendas according to their uh, technological needs. Um, and the second side of this process in, is the um, uh, a plan to, to increase the productivity of variable part of capital that is of the uh, workforce itself and this is, this is based on the, um, on the theories and policies uh, of human capital or human capital development and uh, regarding this, this first, um, first uh, process to, to increase the productivity of, of constant capital here um, a keyword or a buzzword is social social returns to to knowledge so this is this is um, defined as an investment in knowledge and technological development that will yield uh, um, that will yield returns to to all of the society where society is being reduced and and equated with the with the needs of capital or with the needs of, of private sector, so society as a whole, when you say the, the, the investment in in technology that will be beneficial to the productivity of machines in the private industry, once you say that you you already admit that you uh, the, that you cannot think of society as a whole uh, apart from uh, the the capital capital relation. Um, and as far as the second strategy goes, the, the human capital part, um, it is being, at least in this, uh, let's say, Europe, Euro speak, uh, it is being individualized. So uh, the, the buzzword here is uh, uh, individual returns to investment in, in knowledge, which serves as a convenient alibi or uh, convenient legitimization of the introduction or the increase, increase in tuition fees and also in the introduction or increase in the amount of, of student credit. So you're probably familiar with the, with the human capital argument. It goes something like this. Um, uh, knowledge, knowledge is not a universal right, but it is a universal social right, um, as, let's say, uh, was this classical enlightenment definition of, of at least higher or university education. But it is an in individual uh, business investment. So you basically you pay uh, you pay a fee in advance, a tuition fee in advance, and this is this is a financial investment into your own educational development. And this this investment will bring you better workplaces, and um, on the same workplaces will bring you higher salary than those who who, who invested less. So in this perspective, it is it is uh, individualized and there is uh, what is lost is this whole perspective or definition of education as a, as a um, 
as a matter an issue for the whole of society, it becomes an issue of, of private individual individual uh, investment. And here the involvement of, of uh, capital or um, a private private uh, business institution is on the level of setting setting the, the curriculum of the pedagogical part of the university education and this this whole pedagogical part becomes subordinated to the needs of the of the labor market so if it if the research part of the university or in some countries like Slovenia where the research part is uh, independent and separate from the university in this case public uh, research institutes uh, become becomes subordinated to private industry as such while while in the teaching uh, in the teaching part uh, they become so um, teaching institutions uh, or teaching parts departments of the university become subordinated to the perceived needs of the labor market from the perspective of, of uh, uh, private capitalists. How much time do you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, there is another large part, but... So what I, uh, what I would like to now now shift the perspective. This this critique is um, is probably uh, known by now. At least I hope this this type of critique of uh, let's say of immediate immediate social uh, so negative immediate negative social effects of this of this type of uh, strategy, which is which is basically a short termist critique. Like uh, studying condition will, will get worse, working conditions will get worse. The quality of the of the teaching um, curriculum or the teaching substance will drop, and so on. This is this is a type of critique that uh, that just wants to. It's a harm reduction. A harm reduction is basically um, a type of critique in a, in a sort of defensive posture. So don't do that because it will only only worsen things. Now, now I would like to add um, add another perspective, which could uh, let's say open up more more basic. Uh, more basic and also uh, uh, sharper long-term criticism of this development, and this is a perspective of uh, from the process of consumption. And also in the in the previous lectures, we were uh, uh, we learned about institutional arrangements, we learned about financial and monetary policies, we learned about working, uh, let's say, labor market policies and so on. But we haven't uh, talked about the. Uh, the sphere of consumption uh, yet, and here uh, consumption in its its broader sense, so not not in not in a sense of shopping or consumerism, but consumption as satisfaction of um, as development and satisfaction of historically uh, determined uh, determined um, uh, human needs. And there, uh, here uh, first I would like to note a certain divide. Uh, among uh, student and university movement in Slovenia, but also from what I could gather on the internet, also also uh, uh, generally. So partly, uh, partly uh, there are fights against cuts and drops in quality brought by, uh, especially by Bologna reform, but there are also um, uh, struggles in uh, struggles that are um, that are essentially conformist. For example, struggles to improve the quality of teaching to, to secure jobs for, uh, for students or uh, struggles to, let's say, uh, work within the intellectual or academic environment to find, to find solutions, uh, solution to the capitals, uh, to the, to the capitals crisis. So basically they are conformist in a sense that they want to contribute in solving the crisis, but they, <coughs> um, the question how to solve capitalism remains remains outside um, um, outside of the scope outside of the scope. So so this while it while it's sometimes necessary, um, if there is no no long term vision for this strategy to 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 take a broader, a more critical perspective. Uh, it could it could uh, easily get reduced to the rector's view uh, that, uh, that I criticized earlier. So uh, to broaden the perspective, uh, I would like to uh, introduce a, a, a concept of misery, um, uh, which I, which I borrow from the situationist uh, situationist critique of the uh, intellectual and academic life in in France in the 60s. Um, in this famous pamphlet called the, the Misery of Student Life, 
So misery as in distinction as a specifically capitalist uh, social process in distinction to poverty. So probably um, sociologists uh, talk about, when they talk about poverty, they talk about absolute and um, <coughs> absolute and uh, relative poverty. So absolute poverty meaning you cannot secure basic means of, of subsistence like clothing, uh, shelter over your head, food, and so on. And the relative power being, um, uh, re relative poverty being uh, deprived, deprived in relation to historically established uh, standards, standard of human needs or standards of, of consumption. So when I when I refer to misery, it is close to this uh, sociological concept of 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 uh, uh, relative uh, relative poverty, and it's a, it's a, it's it's a phenomenon specific to only to capitalist society. Um, if all modes of production, historically speaking, knew about absolute poverty, this what I call misery is is uh, historically specific only to only to capitalist society. And to to illustrate maybe better what I mean by misery, um, and uh, this. Um, I will use Marx's example. For example, if you have in one street, if a family lives in a, in a house of, say, 100 square meters, and everybody else in the same street lives in a house of 100 square meters, they, they are content and they are not miserable and everything is okay. But as soon as the neighbors build a house of, of 500 square or 200 square meters, they, they're being, uh, the family that still lives, resides in a house of 100 square meters becomes objectively deprived. They, they are worse off, although nothing has qualitatively changed in the, in the, in the way they live. But the, the whole uh, social dynamism, the whole social development went on and left them behind. So, so they are miserable, or they, although they, they might not even know it or recognize it, they, they might be perfectly, maybe still content or emotionally in that house, but ob objectively they, they are being immiserated by staying in, in, the, in the small house. So why, why is this phenomenon of misery specific to, to uh, capitalism? Because the because uh, first capitalism is the most the most uh, dynamic um, mode of production known known so far uh, in 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 history of in history of humankind. So it 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 increases uh, produ its productive capacity and we did uh, um, historically determined human needs at a, at a very fast pace at the face uh, at the pace unknown to to any other uh, um, historical historical uh, uh, social uh, social formation so the the whole development of so to speak of productive forces also also uh, also raises the the standards of consumption uh, both material and cultural, intellectual, spiritual, and and so on, uh, but at the same time is is because of the uh, the peculiar capitalist ways of organization of this same ever expanding production, unable to satisfy them. Uh, why it is unable to satisfy them? Because the the capitalist production, although it is constantly uh, uh, increasing its its capacities, its speed, its pro its productivity, is not geared to satisfaction of of uh, human needs, but it's geared to uh, to self -valorisa valorization of value. So the whole the whole point of capitalist production is. For value to uh, for value to uh, to self expand to generate more value to generate surplus value, or in this circuit for money to to breed money with this little uh, I don't know how it is called in English, but uh, to simplify for money to breed uh, to bring more money where satisfaction of human needs is just an uh, unfortunate unfortunate but necessary side step, but it's really it's really secondary in in importance to, to the uh, self-valorization of value. Unfortunately, in a sense that if capitalists could find a way to generate surplus value without satisfying any human need, they would do it without uh, thinking twice. So it's not a satisfaction of, of uh, historically developed human needs. It's not very high on the capitalist uh, priority needs. The, the only problem is to sell anything. So uh, to sell anything you have produced, it has to have some 
some use value for somebody, otherwise you wouldn't be able to sell it. But this is the satisfaction of, of human needs by, by a mediation. It's a secondary, it's not, it's indirect, it's not a direct uh, um, a satisfaction of human needs. So the process of consumption defined as the development and the satisfaction of historical human needs within capitalism takes a basically a Tantalian form after this character from the ancient Greek story who would stand up to his knees in water but would remain thirsty because when he would reach for a water it would withdraw and the same with he would be surrounded by delicious fruits but when he would reach for them they would they would uh, withdraw out of out of his reach so um, and this is precisely what what generates uh, uh, what uh, what uh, I have referred to, to uh, as misery. And another problem uh, which brings about this Tantalian uh, character of the consumption, uh, of consumption uh, under, under capitalism is that the satisfaction of human needs is constrained and um, constrained and conditions by the development of, of uh, commodity form. So if, if a certain thing is not, a, is not a commodity, if it does not or does not yet assume a commodity form, it cannot be sold and therefore its use value cannot satisfy any, any human needs. And now in, the, in, the, in a historical situation where European Union or governments of the European Union try to regain or increase their competitiveness by contraction, of, of social provisions and social services, there are, there are some, there are many services and many human activities that, that do not yet have a commodity form and which pose and they pose a lot of problems for capitalists to turn them into, uh, into a commodity form. For example, things like medical care or knowledge or education are not, are not as easily converted. I, I don't mean I'm not an agrarian, I don't think it's impossible and that it will uh, break, the, break the capitalism, but I recognize that, uh, um, that it is much harder to convert, uh, to convert knowledge into commodity. It takes a lot of work and a lot of thinking. And uh, instead of, let's say, if medical care organized in the universal health, public health care system or education, uh, organized as, as, as some universal public system uh, satisfies a human need for, for health or uh, knowledge uh, directly by direct expenditure. Uh, now there is a, with the contraction of public provision of such services or uh, um, uh, there, there is always a gap, there, there, is, a, there is a lack between when, when, when and how it can be converted into the commodity form. So also the consumption in this sense, not, not consumption as consumerism, but consumption as satisfaction, um, uh, uh, becomes Tantalian also in a sense of cultural, with the, with the contraction of public finances for culture and so on, also becomes uh, Tantalian, uh, Tantalian uh, um, in, in this sense. So. Um, so basically you need to have, we are coming increasingly to the situation where we have to wait instead of satisfying our needs directly, we have to wait for this whole market mediation and the development of a, of a sufficiently, a sufficiently um, commercially friendly uh, commodity form of things such as education, culture, uh, theoretical, uh, um, uh, theoretical uh, production. And he, I'm running out of time, I would just like to quote Marx once again, uh, <laughs> because this is the most important thing if you have three minutes left. And uh, Marx says regarding the, this aspect of, um, I had a very, very witty quote regarding this aspect of capitalist production for production's sake, not for the sake of, of uh, human needs. He said the worker wants the process of alienation in the production process, the process whereby worker gets separated from the product that he makes. Um, Marx describes this as worker doesn't give a damn about junk that he makes, but capitalist gives even less damn about the junk that, uh, <laughs> that he's producing in his factory. So they both don't, don't care about junk, but this is this, is, um, this problem about uh, um, commodities that are produced within the capitalist mode of production being junk um, becomes even more pronounced when, when these commodities being junk 
uh, our, our culture and education. And I think, I think this is visible to anybody who's been consuming in that sense uh, higher education after Bologna reform or uh, cultural production after the, the large cuts in, in uh, public financial provision, provision uh, uh, for culture. So I'd just like to briefly conclude with the critique of the, of the, um, of the standard or usual moralistic or liberal critique of consumption as, as, as uh, um, consumerism. Um, this, uh, this critique about uh, the text, this uh, type of moral form, we consume too much, we are a materialist, we only care about, we only care about our selfish needs, we should look to each other and hug each other and hold hands. And, um, this type is based on a, on a false premise that capitalist production is actually geared towards satisfaction of, of human needs and that what is needed to, to solve the different, different problems that arise within the capitalist society like, like problem, problems of emptiness and misery of our everyday lives and alienation in maybe in this more emotional, uh, emotional sense, but also let's say some very concrete problems like, like environmental problems could be, could be solved by the reduction in the quantitative amount of consumption. So this, uh, this is, it is based on this very naive assumption that if we use less paper, we will save Amazon uh, rainforest. So uh, it shifts the blames to the to the working class consumers, not to the way it mystifies uh, or masks the way that uh, that wood is actually turned into paper in this uh, very very intense exploitation of of natural environment. So the problem is that we use paper, not that the transformation from wood to paper is organized in the in the in the uh, um, uh, capitalist, uh, uh, capitalist way. So I, I would like to, to propose to, to, to turn this, this uh, perspective around this moralist critic of consumption and to affirm there's nothing wrong with, uh, with uh, human consumption, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, and it is not the problem that we want or desire or demand too much, the problem is that we get too little, and uh, what we get, to return to Marx, is uh, the, the little that we get, especially considering uh, uh, contemporary education, culture, or intellectual production in general, is junk. That would be my conclusion. Pretty much, uh, as earlier, the debate will be suspended into the second, after the second talk. Uh, so, allow me to greet uh, Anina Kaltenbühler. Uh, Anina is assistant researcher at Leeds University Business School and a PhD student at uh, School of Oriental and African Studies. And the title of her talk is uh, Peripheral Countries in the Eurozone. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here for, for three reasons. I guess I'm here um, partly because I contributed to Costas, Costas Lapovitsa's report. So I guess my role was probably to um, present the report and present our conclusions. Um, I will partly do so, but I will also kind of go a bit beyond this because, um, yes, I've got my own issues with the report. Um, the second reason why it's great to be here is because I am, I'm actually a lecturer now at Leeds University, so I finished my PhD at SOAS, I'm a lecturer at Leeds University, and I'm teaching a group of 65 students, economists, so I'm an economist, who all want to go into the city. Um, so I have spent an entire term trying to convince them or trying to give them a bit of a left perspective on the European Union, so it's amazing to see all these people here, and I wish my students could be here um, and listen to all that. And finally, it's lovely to be here because I'm, I'm Austrian and I'm just from across the border. I'm from Filak. I don't know how it's called. I was told. Yeah, how was it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So every time I go home, I fly into Ljubljana Airport. So I've been to Ljubljana Airport six times in the last year and I've never been to Ljubljana. So it's great to actually be here. Um, basically, what I'm going to say, so I'm a development economist by background and I work in emerging markets and on the Eurozone crisis. So I don't think I'm going to say anything of very much new of what we haven't already heard today, but I think what I'm going to try to do is I put, a bit, put a bit of an economics perspective on it, because I'm ultimately I'm a development economist, 
So the way I look at the Eurozone crisis is very much from the point of view from development theory, developing in emerging countries or peripheral and transition countries. And that's how I kind of want to look. I mean, we had already excellent presentations on the morning and I don't really have much to add to that. I might have to add a bit in terms of economic theory, how we can back up our um, demands for an alternate, alternative strategy. I have um, prepared amazing slides with some graphs. I'm not going to put them up because I don't think they really add very much to the argument. Um, and, but, you know, we economists are obsessed with graphs and, um, and figures, but I'm going to leave them away. So what I'm going to, very, very succinctly, what I'm going to try to say is, first of all, I want to just repeat what I think is the fundamental problem of the Eurozone and has always been. And based on that interpretation of the um, Eurozone crisis or Eurozone problem, I want to just highlight or set out the options which I think peripheral countries have. And I'm probably going to not really end up on a conclusion, just kind of on a wish list of uh, things I would love to see to happen without ever thinking or um, still hoping that it will happen. So just to kind of go to the fundamental problem of the Eurozone crisis, I totally agree with um, John Weeks um, with yesterday. I don't think the Eurozone crisis is a fiscal crisis at all, not at all. What do you, but however, there is a crisis, and what I think the Eurozone crisis is, is a balance of payments crisis. And it was a balance of payments crisis which has been in the making since the beginning, and it's also, and it has been kind of predicted by economic theory, which ultimately says if you unite heterogeneous nation states, and if you unite nation states with different GDP, different income, you will create imbalances. And these imbalances will be at the expense of the core. So right from the beginning, the Eurozone, European integration, and particularly the Eurozone and the Monetary Union, was a core peripheral model, which was set up by the core, um, and which was set up to gain for the core at the expense of the periphery. So the Monetary Union itself was a neoliberal project right from the beginning, and that was known to economic theory. So economic theory we said, we said right from the beginning, if you introduce a common currency between all these nation states, what you will have, what you need to have, is either wage flexibility, and all of us who have a bit of Keynes in mind know that wage flexibility, A, isn't really something which is there, and B, it's also the question whether we want this to happen. Finally, or second, you would need labor mobility, which we also do not have in the European Union. And if we, all, if we don't have all of this, what we need to have is fiscal transfers. Now, this was set out by Keynesian theory. It was ignored when the Eurozone was set up. The monetarists won the, won the battle. And rather than having kind of fiscal transfers between the nation states, the kind of the rising imbalances between the countries were hoped to be closed by, um, or were closed by capital flows. So what we had is, I mean, I have a kind of a few slides here on Current, in current account imbalances between the country and the different inflation rates. What we basically had, we had different nations integrating into a monetary union, different levels of income, different levels of inflation rate. What initially happened before the introduction of the Eurozone is that countries who were weaker, who had a kind of a um, or high inflation rate, used to defend themselves by exchange of devaluation, so they protected themselves through a weak exchange rate. That was not possible anymore with the Eurozone, so the automatic result had to be current account imbalances. Now, in the kind of progressive Eurozone, and we're going to talk about it a bit later, how these imbalances would be closed would be through regional transfers. So if the core gets the kind of has an advantage of the fixed exchange rate, of the periphery not devaluating the currency anymore, what should be the compensating mechanism should be fiscal transfers and regional policy. And this is something which has been demanded by the periphery all over, over and over again. So Italy, Spain, in the kind of um, history of the formation of the European Union, have always demanded very, very strongly there is an increased element of regional policy, structural policy, and so on and so forth. Nothing has happened. Regional policy at the moment is 0.3% of the GDP of the entire European Union. So the concept of some form of distribution between the countries has been absolutely ignored um, in, in the kind of setup of the European Union. So economic theory in this respect has been ignored. Now, what has been the result? Well, current account <coughs> deficits, as we have, have, we have, it in, have we heard in the morning, current account deficits had to be counterbalanced by capital flows. These capital flows um, led to build up on mainly private debt, a bit of public debt in Greece, but what capital flows or external capital flows primarily do is they create external vulnerabilities and they create, create external dependencies. So not only we had the current account imbalances, and as a result of which the peripheral countries remained in a kind of dependence to the financial system, 
because they have to finance their, their current account deficits and to kind of wear wool number two that if you want the vagaries of the financial markets and the decisions of the financial markets. So ultimately what we are facing in pure economic terms is we're just facing a kind of if you want a fourth generation of balance of payments crisis. We have seen it in the Asian countries, we have seen it in Argentina and Brazil and so on and so forth. <coughs> we have just seen another kind of element or example where weaker nations get together in a monetary union or they're kind of in a, in a joint uh, exchange of arrangements um, and which result in a kind of uh, in a crisis or attack on these nations. The only difference which we have now is that we don't have a local currency anymore, so we cannot have a currency attack. What we have is an attack on national debt, sovereign debt. Um, which we kind of see playing out in the financial markets. So ultimately, and obviously the result of the, you know, the financial crisis, the attack on the, on the sovereign debts, a crisis, or austerity, a kind of um, crisis resolution which is um, played out in the back of labor. So we have a kind of a monetary eurozone which, um, which uh, kind of arises as a result of the imbalance and arises as a result of the um, suppression of labor and also the crisis resolution is at the back of labor. And I think this is a point that I very much agree with the IMF report. One of the main differences or one of the main underlying issues in the Eurozone is not, and we've heard that again also, is not the laziness in the peripheral countries, um, it's basically wage suppression in Germany, which has, um, Germany didn't have any well, real wage increases in the last 10 years, which has gained competitiveness on the back of labour and which has gained competitiveness um, relative to peripheral countries. So it's not the peripheral countries which are out of line, the peripheral countries have been doing very well, it's Germany which has kind of maintained the export-led um, growth, the kind of mercantilist project on the back of labor. So I think I very much agree. So there is a crisis, but it's definitely not. It's definitely not a fiscal crisis. It's just one. Mm. A balance of payments crisis, and it's a crisis of a kind of a core peripheral model. And the peripheral countries are kind of in a union um, which works against in the disadvantage, which has increased divergences between uh, the countries in the eurozone. So this is just a kind of like a bit of an um, overview and summary and of, the, of the interpretation of the crisis which we have heard yesterday very interesting and also this morning. So I didn't really want to go that much into it and I have a few graphs to show this. Now but what are the options for the, for the countries? I mean what can we really do and what can we particularly do from an um, economic perspective? So I'm not a political analyst, what I'm trying to do is to understand it from an economic side, what are our options and what are our feasible options? Well, at the moment, the feasible the options which we have is not feasible. We have austerity, we have adjustment, we have status quo, which ultimately tries, if we think about it, which tries, tries to solve the Eurozone crisis by gaining competitiveness in the peripheral country through suppressing wages. So we're kind of entering a deflationary spiral. Germany doesn't want to adjust the wages, so what we have to do is we have to adjust the wages of peripheral countries even further. So we're kind of, kind of the, the, the problem, the competitiveness problem is trying to be solved by suppressing peripheral countries' wages even further. Um, at, the, at the same time, you know, fiscal transfers are happening, or fiscal transfers which should, in the monetary union, should be automatic. You know, in a monetary union, fiscal transfers should uh, come at no cost. They should be implemented into the whole regime by itself. We shouldn't ask an interest rate for <coughs> fiscal fiscal transfers, but we do see to see fiscal transfers at very high interest rate, at very high conditions, austerity and so forth. And we do see something which we call in the IMF report, we see something which is creditor led default. So we had some, a bit of restructuring on the Greek debt, but very minimal and also at the kind of decisions of the banks, you know. Certain banks have agreed to some form of restructuring, some hedge funds have not agreed. So ultimately um, the type or the, the amount and the size of the restructuring of the Greek debt um, remains very limited. So this is a situation where we have and where we also know all of us that this cannot, I mean there's only a one way road and it's a very bad road and I think John Weeks pointed that out yesterday. So from a political and economic point of view the way which we are moving is unsustainable. We have seen worsening debt ratios, so rather than kind of a reduction in the debt we have seen increased debt ratios because GDP has fallen. Uh, in Greece the debt is now 10 to 20 cent per percent higher than it was before. We've seen debt deflation as a result of the reduction in debt. People have not been able to meet the outstanding obligations, particularly private debt, households, and so on and so forth. We see the amazing or the, the out 
horrendous social cost of the austerity measures with, um, I mean, I don't know whether you had time to look at the FT this morning, every, is it every fourth person in Spain is now unemployed and every second um, youth is unemployed, so we have a youth unemployment rate of 50%, which is just tremendous, tremendous social costs. And ultimately it's also, I mean, we've seen an ECB which is powerless, so we're trying to solve the Eurozone problems only through monetary policy, the ECB has been injecting liquidity into the financial system, but the banks have not been passing on. The only thing what the banks have done is they have bought more sovereign bonds and in a way come increasingly exposed to the, to the uh, peripheral debt. And we also actually see something which is absolutely um, destructive and also has no way of working. Because we're in a deflationary spiral, um, where wage cuts in peripheral countries, austerity in peripheral countries actually reduces the only motor which the Eurozone ultimately has, which was demand from the peripheral countries for, you for um, German exports. So even that element has now fallen apart. So we're really in a downward spiral where I don't see how we can, any, how we can get out in a way. And I'm, sometimes I'm surprised, I and mean, we know it's capital, and we know you know, we know that a huge economic interest um, at stake, but sometimes I'm surprised by the stupidity of what is going on. Because even from a purely economic point of view, there's no way how we can get out um, of, the current, of the current situation. So it's a bit like watching, I call it a, a slow train crash. It's a bit like a train just slowly, slowly um, driving towards the wall and just having to hit the wall at some, at some point. And also in the financial sector, you know, as a result of falling GDP, peripheral sovereign debt has even worsened, the financial sector is in a really worse situation, and um, sooner or later banks will have to be bailed out, and so on and so forth. So this is the situation where we're in, and we all know, and I don't think there's any doubt that this is a situation where we cannot, where we cannot remain. The big question is what we do, what we want, and how do we get there. So I was kind of, I was very... It was actually, it was very difficult for me to present here because we had written a talk with RMF and I was very strongly thinking, what am I going to say? And I've, I've told my students um, on Tuesday that I was actually quite nervous because I just didn't know what to tell people because I didn't have an opinion yet. So I had a really good focus group with them. I discussed with all of them and I actually got them engaged for the first time. Um, and I kind of decided, well, in order for me, oh, just on a very personal level, for me in order to solve or to know what we want and where we want to go is to start out with something what we want in the end, where do we want to get. Um, and I think ultimately what, and I'm not talking about anyone else, I'm talking just about me personally, what I do want to get is I want to, uh, I want to have a progressive Europe. I do not want to have a kind of a falling apart in nation states again and some nationalistic tendencies and I think Jan agrees very much with me that we had long discussions on that. So what we ultimately want to have is a progressive Europe which works for all workers and capital, no, which works for workers um, <laughs> here we go. I was, I was on my second sentence. <laughs> but which works, which works for poor and horrific countries. No, that was not a Freudian slip. <laughs> I promise. It's a business school. It's a business school, exactly. No, but I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even tell my students that. <laughs> Oh, the so what, what do we want? Sometimes and I am... Um, just works for the capital. <laughs> <laughs> we want, uh, for your students, it will be just, we want Europe that works for capital. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh God, if I get at least only 2% out of these people, out of the course, who kind of change their mind, then I would already be happy, then I've achieved my purpose for the year. But anyway, so, I mean, from a purely, and I totally agree what we have heard up to now, from a purely kind of, um, uh, what do we want is we want to have a progressive Europe. So I very much kind of in an idealistic world, in a Turkian world, I very much agree with the line of Engelbert. I've just seen a kind of presentation by him last week that what we need is we need to solve the problem not by a deflationary spiral but an inflationary spiral. So what we need to do is we need to increase German wages, we need to kind of stop the real pressures on the real wages in Germany, we need to stimulate demand, we need to kind of um, stimulate consumption, which then in turn would stimulate uh, demand and consumption in peripheral countries, and in a way, grow us out of the crisis. Yeah? Um, we need some form of debt restructuring. I'm not saying debt is not a problem, although I very much also agree with what John said. Debt would solve itself to a certain extent through the growth, because we have a, you know, it's measured debt to GDP, and if we do get out of the, if we do get out of the deflation as well and the growth, the debt ratios will also fall. One country which definitely needs some form of restructuring is Greece. But if we're very honest, Greece is relatively small compared to the other countries. And I do, I do not think that, apart from the Greek banks, but we can talk about that, um, it would not tremendously or substantially affect the European financial sector. 
So I think uh, some form of debt quick debt restructuring is definitely possible. In this in this move or in this kind of event, so good Euro, progressive uh, progressive Euro world, we would also need a joint uh, fiscal union. So we would have to uh, have a complementation of monetary policy of the operations by the ECB for some form of fiscal unification, either Euro bond or um, even you know moving towards a uh, towards a fiscal state. Well, something like transfers is not an exception anymore, but is incorporated into the system, some European federalism. And that obviously would mean also very strong transfers between countries, that would mean regional policy, and that would even mean maybe some kind of reduction in the uh, trade liberalization, trade protection, trade subsidies, export subsidies, and so on and so forth, which also is something which John Weeks has been um, uh, advertising yesterday. Now, following up on the discussion which has been there before and which I've heard outside on the, um, uh, in, the, in the break, is this something which I think is going to happen? No. I just can't see at the moment, I just can't see how we can get this progressive Europe, at least not now. And I do agree that we need to have a solution now. We might get it in, whatever, five years down the line when the social cost in the peripheral countries has increased to such an extent that there is no... Um, way out anymore, but I do not see any solution um, at the moment. I just don't see how we can get that, you know, can have this progressive Europe happen as much as I would love it um, to to happen. Except one thing which I'm going to, um, which I'm going to manage, uh, which I'm going to um, uh, mention later. And I think Argentina, the comparison with Argentina is a difficult one, but I think the, Argentina, the comparison with Argentina helps us in one respect. It helps us to show how much the social cost actually has to go in order to actually force change. The Argentinian situation was considerably, was even worse than the Greek situation is today. Is today the, the Argentinian system was deprived of any liquidity. People haven't, didn't have the money to buy their things. That was the, that was the stage where the Argentinian system broke apart. We are not there yet, and it will meet much more cost in order to get there. So as much as I would love this progressive Europe to happen, I just can't see where we, um, whether this is in any way possible. And I very much agree with the comment which was made before, is that ultimately, you know, the European, it's also taken out of our hand, and the European institutions are neoliberal institutions. The European institutions have been set up to kind of maintain that neoliberal project. I've seen a very nice paper, a very nice quote that, um, Hayek apparently supported the monetary union or the European integration just for that reason because he said nation states would never be able to set through the reforms I would want to see. So we need to put it on the kind of um, European level, on the get it out of democracy in order to set through the kind of complete market, market liberalization and free market which I would like to see. So that in itself shows something. Okay, well, what are the options? And what are the options, the options which we are discussing in the IMF report with Costas Lapavitsas? First of all, it's any single exit. So if we just talk about one country, let's take Greece, because I think it's the easiest example, and I think it's, um, in a way, it's easier. And it's also where the social situation and the kind of the, um, how would we call it, the urgency is probably highest in all countries, although not much other than in other countries are not that much better. So what would single exit do? Well, there are three main reasons, I mean, why we would want to have um, one country to leave the Eurozone. First of all, I mean, the kind of the main hope is that we would leave the Eurozone and we would solve the competitiveness problem through devaluation. That's ultimately the main argument. We want to kind of regain our competitiveness through nominal depreciation and ideally we would also cause a real depreciation with that. The second main argument which we make in the report is that leaving the Eurozone on our own terms or on Greek's terms would, would allow a debtor-led restructuring. So it would allow to cut the debt substantially and also make the debt service sustainable and not kind of have a creditor-led restructuring where basically the conditions and the size is given by the creditor community. And finally, the third main argument which has been made for the single exit is to take nation state out of the kind of um, institutional framework of the Eurozone and allow domestic um, economic policies again, industrial policy, trade policy, and so on and so forth. These are the main, I mean, these, and I think in a nutshell, and you can read 372 pages if you want to, the, the IMRF reports are coming out as a book now, so if you want to have as a book, you can read the kind of um, but I think these are the three main, um, if you want to, reasons or points why, uh, why to leave the Eurozone as a single exit. 
Now, what are the costs? And I think um, we have very much, we heard the costs in the morning, when there are huge <coughs> adjustment costs in the short term. And again, I refer you to the report, which is to, um, to have a more in-depth view, but there's, first of all, there's a the problem of exchange rate prices. We devalue the exchange rate. We have a huge overshooting in the exchange rate. There's the fear of inflationary pressures. Even hyperinflation has been mentioned. There's obviously the problem of how does the, uh, there's the problem of the fiscal crisis. How does the nation state continue to finance itself, shut out from international financial markets? The problem of banking <coughs> crisis. We devalue the exchange rate. The debt of the banks triples, quadruples, and so on and so forth. Um, which has to lead in a banking crisis. Um, and finally, and this is Jan's argument, what do we do with the debt? Because if we devalue our exchange rate, our debt, the private sector debt, the public sector debt, is going to triple, quadruple, and so on and so forth. How are we going to service that? I think these are all very valid points. And I, but I do ultimately think that these things would be manageable to a certain extent. <coughs> Um, I cannot go into the details, but I think imposition of capital controls would mean the exchange rate might not overshoot that much. I think inflation is, in the current conditions, a problem which is much overrated um, in the current world of globalization and so forth. One thing we are forgetting fundamentally is once we do go back to our, national, to our nation state and to our own um, country, we also have, and we regain our central bank, we also have the option of monetization. So we can use the central bank to finance um, certain expenditures, which again, um, I do not, you know, there's the, the risk or the kind of the threat of um, inflation, inflation as a result of monetization, which I again do not think that in the current, at least as in, in a transition, would not be so much of a problem. Um, banks would have to be nationalized anyway, if I restructure, I'm not I'm only talking about Greek now, if I restructure my Greek debt substantially, the banks will go bankrupt because the banks are the main holder of Greek debt. So ultimately you cannot avoid that. And I do not think bank nationalization is, a big, um, is something which we should avoid, quite to the contrary. Um, and going back, and it could be financed through monetization um, through the central bank. So I don't think, I mean, I think the adjustment costs are a big problem of leaving the Eurozone. I mean, there's a cost, um, but I think that can be overcome, for example, even of going, one thing I forget to, I forgot to say, if we have the kind of monetization, if we have some form of fiscal space again, import subsidies, export subsidies, trade policy, industrial policy, these are all possible. So it's, it's a kind of transition period. However, what I've got two, so I think in, in this respect, I absolutely agree with the IMF report and I absolutely agree with what we have written. I have, however, two problems with that. And the first one is that as a, develop, as a developing economist and as an emerging market economist, I just don't think that this is a viable, viable medium-term strategy for a country like Greece. I do think that in a globalized world in which we do live, a country on its own um, has, it's very difficult to actually follow the path I've set out of industrial policy, trade policy, and so on and so forth, um, and to kind of have a successful strategy. I work, my main area of specialization is Latin America, I work in Brazil, I work in Argentina, and if these countries are struggling substantially to kind of survive in the, in the international monetary system or in the international economic system. So I just don't think, apart from the adjustment costs, I just don't think that Greece leaving and standing on its own would be a viable strategy in the medium term. I think there are just too many, you know, uh, trade competition from, from China. Um, the difficulty to manage their exchange rates, my specialization is exchange rates. Managing exchange rates for small countries is one of the most difficult issues um, at the moment, even with, even with capital controls. Yeah? And finally, so this is the one element. As a development economist, I'm just not sure whether um, Greece on its own or any peripheral country on its own, maybe except Spain because that's very big, is actually something which is a kind of a medium-term strategy which I would want to see. And finally, I think that is um, where my, um, where I think a, a lot of the tension in the left between the left economists comes from is that finally also I'm not sure whether, to put it that way, sometimes what I would do for a country as a development economist is different from what I would quite like to see as a European. 
and as a kind of like wanting a progressive Europe and actually wanting a European project to work. So I don't think leaving countries on the, on the, or the single countries leaving, ultimately it's just not, if I want to go back to what I said before, it's not what I would want to see as an ultimate utopia of the progressive Europe. So I just think it would be a step back rather than a step forward in this way. And that, I think, and that brought me think, and that made me thinking. And I, I very much like that this has come up over and over again in the discussion. That I think maybe what we should try, at least as a transition period, of one thing which could be a viable strategy, is some form, some form of South-South integration, cooperation. Um, if you want to, um, a peripheral Europe, a peripheral Europe. And I think that would be, I mean, from a purely economic point of view, um, I think that would be preferable for two reasons. First of all, it would make the adjustment cost, so the immediate leaving, much, much, much lower. We have a big economic space, so bigger economic space. The exchange rate devaluation would be lower. We are not so dependent on imports because we have a bigger economic space. We could substitute imports much more between us as a result of, you know, we wouldn't need to, we wouldn't rely so much on having to import at the devalued exchange rate. We could support each other fiscally. And importantly, we would have a much bigger central bank with much more um, firepower in order to defend an exchange rate, which we would have a, a common external value of the exchange rate to defend that exchange rate, and also to support the fiscal, the, the fiscal um, state. So monetization in this, in this situation could also be possible. So just to kind of, um, and also a final, and so sorry about that, as a final point, also debt restructuring, because that would mean that all the debt which is within that core periphery would not necessarily have to be structured, it's just the one which is outside, and that can be negotiated. So I think a South-South uh, Union um, would help with the adjustment costs as, a, as, a kind of as an immediate exit. And I think that finally also a South-South integration is maybe something which, going back to my problem as a medium-term development strategy, might be something which is more viable than the kind of the monetary union um, by itself, because we have countries, theoretically, which are more heterogi uh, homogeneous, um, more of a different level of economic uh, development, so the kind of the discrepancy, the divergences between the countries aren't too big, um, which could kind of make a monetary union more um, viable. Um, and ultimately, I think on a political level, so this is the adjustment cost, medium term strategy, and also on a political level, um, having a kind of like a counter block against the core. Um, might you know would would give would give the peripheral countries much more force and much more power and much more weight in any form of negotiations between the two blocks. Came it to exchange rate arrangements, came it to um, trade trade agreements or trade um, liberalisation or trade um, relationships between the two. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, first of all. Even within peripheral countries, there are stronger and weaker ones. So even there is the question whether um, that is a kind of a viable strategy. And I think that in the in the in the medium term, of what we ultimately will need is we will we'll need solidarity between the European states, and we will need transfers and support between the European states. Um, the second problem with that is, and I think that is also what has been mentioned before, is. The question is whether, just because peripheral countries leave, whether this is then something which actually works to the favour of labour um, and doesn't really and doesn't um, support capitalist um, capitalist interests, because even if the peripheries are in opposition to the core, um, that doesn't mean that the kind of that the capitalist elite isn't very strong in the peripheral countries either. And finally, and that's probably the big question, is whether that would, would something like a core periphery euro um, or kind of a south-south integration, would that be then um, a step out to more progressive Europe? Would we, would we be using that as a kind of a transitory arrangement? Um, or would that actually mean that the kind of a more integrated Europe or the project of a more integrated Europe has failed and that we just have to kind of remain, um, remain in, smaller, in smaller blocks? 
Yeah, and I think the final thing I want to say is that, and that's just the kind of the thought which comes, came through the discussion, I think ultimately, maybe also um, thinking about the South and South, South integration or a, a kind of a periphery euro um, and the kind of the economic feasibility of it gives at least a credible threat to the core um, for changes in the current setup in the monetary union. Because one thing which is clear, if the Eurozone breaks apart, the core suffers just as much as the periphery. Because the only reason why Germany and Austria and Netherlands have been doing well is because of the setup of the Eurozone. So the core has to be just as afraid of the domestic periphery from breaking apart. So using that as a lever might actually be one of the most feasible options at the moment to um, move to a more progressive Europe, as we would quite like to see it. That's it. It's almost technical, but I, I just want to congratulate you on using the element of fear towards the core as an argument. Can we say that again? I just want to congratulate you on using fear directed towards the core okay. as part of the argument. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah, uh, pretty much. Uh, I think I almost totally disagree. Uh, with your points, I would like to viciously criticize you and then wait for your reaction, which I hope is verbal and not physical. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to uh, first to point out that, that uh, a similar argument was one of the strongest arguments of uh, Milton Friedman. He said, well, if you compare like with like, well, those are his, his words, there is no system that uh, guarantees such a high standard of uh, living in material terms than uh, capitalism. It, it was uh, a quite effective uh, argument. Um, so I think this power of the market to actually satisfy needs uh, to a certain extent should not be uh, underestimated. This, it is quite powerful in that sense. Uh, and the effectiveness of this argument uh, can vary you know, uh, according to historical conditions. Of course, today it might be more powerful when the standard of living is actually uh, decreasing or that, uh, or since uh, real wages have been stagnating for some time. Uh, so, I think a more productive argument would be, you know, how much shit do you actually need? So, not to focus uh, only on this side of consumption, but also production. Uh, so when you have, you know, three cars, a house, uh, cognac, cigars, ten bicycles, uh, and so on, uh, you probably start to prefer working less, uh, having less stress at work to uh, consumption. So perhaps, uh, at least in the developed countries, this could be uh, a much more productive argument. Uh, that we should not strive to increase uh, consumption, uh, but to reduce working hours. Uh, and maintain uh, production so that the productivity goes into reducing working hours, uh, improving the quality of work instead of um, increased consumption. The other uh, argument would be uh, from the standpoint of environment. As far as I know, the only no a known way to decrease the impact of the economy on, on the environment is actually to actually shrink uh, the, the economy. I think there are some uh, models by economists that prophesy that uh, in a future point, increased GDP would go together with uh, decreased impact on the environment, but only under the assumption that resources are infinite, uh, which is also, I think, uh, uh, a weak, uh, a weak assumption. So, I would like your reaction to that. Okay, um, I thought it was pretty clear when I defined consumption as development and satisfaction of human needs, not. Um, in, in broad sense, not as a necessarily only consumption of uh, material and commodities. I mean, in, in capitalism, almost whole of consumption, the more capitalism becomes capitalist, um, this is not a, not a contradiction because there are spheres of life and also spheres of consumption is in this broad sense, for example, like talking to a friend or walking in sunshine that are not commodities. I mean, you, you consume sunshine, sunshine, but it's not a commodity. So this is non-capitalist aspect of consumption within capitalism. 
Um, so, so it's not just buying two houses and three cars. You also consume your free time because you, de you develop your more sophisticated um, human needs. You just focus more on, to be precise, when you consume your free time and you read books instead of, let's say, buying a car or working more. You focus more on this non-capitalist di dimension of, of uh, your, your general, uh, general consumption. So, so I think we are in disagreement only terminologically. In, in, in this regard. What is the problem with capitalism is that um, <coughs> that um, in, together with increased productivity and the cheapening of goods, you know, this classic Schumpeter's argument that it brings uh, nylon stockings to all the, to all the factory shop girls um, because of such high, high levels of production of ever cheapening goods and raises the material and so on. The problem is that the, the, it also raises the, the historical level. I'm basing my argument here on the, the Leibowitz, uh, Michael Leibowitz book, Beyond Capital. Um, increases the, the development of human needs progresses faster than the, the productivity um, that, can satisfy, that can satisfy them adequately, simply because that would be my addition, because commodity form is inadequate to the, the more sophisticated, so this disparity that they called misery between the uh, productive potential of capitalism and the, the, the capacity of, of commodities to, to satisfy such highly developed sophisticated needs grows over time. And this is, this is one of the less pointed out contradiction of uh, contradiction, and uh, this was really insightful for me to, to to bring this uh, dimension out. So this this disparation and relative misery keeps growing, uh, despite the growing, let's say, material standards in the in the time of. And I don't think this is something Milton Friedman thought <laughs> thought much about. And uh, um, it's not it's not the same take on the increasing material and uh, also spiritual standard under, under capitalism. What I wanted to point out was the disparity between the growing sophistication of, of needs, let's say, um, not just for food or, or automobiles or uh, houses, but also needs for music, for cultural consumption, for intellectual consumption, which should progressively um, they're going over the point where they can be adequately satisfied by commodities, especially, let's say, by, by uh, let's say, commodified uh, pop music standardized or commodified standardized uh, academic articles, for example. This basically, when I say junk, junk at the end, I was basically referring to contemporary academic uh, um, production with its executive summaries and uh, uh, standard, uh, standardized international English and uh, so on. And, um, you cannot deny that the, con uh, let's say, consumption as the development of human intellectual uh, uh, capacities or potential has far surpassed the, 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 let's say, these proto-commodity types of academic articles that are pushed out of in, in thousands. Um, regarding ecology, um, yeah, I mean, certainly, um, I, I don't know about this, this shrinking, I mean, this, I don't know, I, I would have to read this book about the shrinking of economy. I mean, I've read articles about the, that propose to save the environment, we have to shrink the amount of human beings. So it was like an a indirect, indirect argument for a mass, uh, humanity's mass suicide to save the, the forest or the environment. Or whatever. I mean, uh, but I'm skeptical in general to this quantitative type of, uh, of uh, argument because um, contemporary contemporary uh, economy is a very complex and dynamic dynamic system so there there is a lot of room uh, there is a lot of room for reform adjustment change within it um, and I find it very crude argument if you cut like 20 percent of paper consumption um, then the forest will keep on growing I mean it, it probably applies to whale hunting if you kill less whales more whales will be alive but 
uh, about <laughs> these things. Uh, I mean, you, you have a certain dynamism of the rate of reproduction of the forest, and you can always reorganize, let's say, wood cutting in a less intensive way or in an extensive way, which doesn't <coughs> reduce its, the whole amount of wood cutters in Amazonia or the whole amount of their uh, chainsaws, but uh, reorganize, you reorganize the work and the production process in a way that allows the forest to reproduce itself, I guess. Yeah, I would just uh, like to make a short comment on uh, what you mentioned very briefly actually, and that is uh, the commodification of not only education but uh, knowledge itself. Uh, from your tone, I, uh, some, I, I somehow interpreted you as if the process uh, of the commodification of knowledge was there just as a possibility but not uh, as an actuality. But uh, I think that, uh, especially in regard uh, to the recent production of knowledge, it's uh, the opposite. And uh, by this I want to point out uh, what I think uh, is a crucial field, and that is the field of uh, academic publishing. Uh, in the sense, uh, you, you have a very strong monopoly of the few uh, corporations that own the publishing rights and charge uh, excruciating amounts of money for it. Uh, in the international, let's call it knowledge market, uh, that uh, are uh, so this process is uh, has actually already happened. And uh, what what I think is uh, really disgusting here is that, uh, for example, if you look at uh, the measuring systems for uh, research and uh, the so-called quality of universities, it uh, it's usually assigns uh, higher points uh, for uh, publications that uh, uh, from uh, uh, the pre-publishing yeah, houses yeah. such as, uh, I don't know, Elsevier, uh, for example, which, which is uh, at the present time the main uh, academic publisher uh, for research in the uh, medical and uh, bioscience fields. And uh, I, I, I think this already uh, implicates uh, some, some sort of uh, distinction between those, those who can't, uh, uh, those who can afford to at least officially uh, have access to that uh, sort of research and those who can't. Yeah, I mean, I agree. In, in large part, it has already happened. I mean, not, not only this proto-commodification by means of standardization of length and style and composition of articles where you have to have uh, the standardized introduction and then abstract and keywords and so on and so on. Uh, this, this was kind of a process of proto-commodification, just setting up necessary condition for it to become a sellable good on the, on the academic market. But also, yeah, there, there is also an increasing uh, process of charging people when you want to access uh, this database, so it's... Mm. Yes, uh, what, 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 now that you've uh, mentioned the uh, standardized form, uh, what I think is really interesting here that uh, if you want to publish in an Elsevier journal, uh, if you want to have a non-standard form that uh, still has to be standardized to a certain extent, that is if you have a, a, a longer article or if you include colored pictures and stuff like that, you, as the uh, author of uh, the paper, have to pay around five thousand uh, dollars for it to be actually published. So you you previously invest uh, in uh, uh, the publication of the research, which was already previously paid for. Uh, so an intermediary can uh, can make uh, actually quite an enormous amount of profit for it. I mean, if you look uh, how much uh, the publication cost, I mean, I think all of us here have already uh, uh, read a uh, Routledge book or, or a Routledge journal, and I, th I think the, the minimum cost of a book is like 80 to 100 euros for yeah, yeah. Ju just to carry out the logistics. I think the argument is yes, but we have uh, uh, quality peer review and so on, mm -hmm. but the interesting fact here is that the peer review for uh, this kind of publications is actually made voluntarily, so no one gets actually paid for the peer review. Uh, Franco, uh, a comment on uh, Professor uh, Katrin Brunner. No, oh, it's not Professor yet. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, but it's not only on uh, your uh, uh, 
brilliant uh, lecture, but also on, uh, I think, uh, other uh, professors, professors uh, here from the Soviet. Now, uh, my impression is that yours and also and uh, the attitude of uh, the radicalism of other professors uh, that, were, that were having lectures here, that were giving lectures here, uh, goes uh, merely as far as, uh, I would say, uh, Keynesian uh, um, radicalism. But uh, this is uh, only one. Uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, astonished. <laughs> Because uh, I, I thought uh, it's uh, quite a radical school. These professors are quite uh, um, radical. <coughs> but on the other hand, um, it seems to me that uh, at, uh, in, I think in the post-war Europe or in the 30s, the, Kine the Keynesian measures uh, itself were uh, were implemented. Uh, the, the condition, one of the conditions for their uh, implementation uh, was precisely the the the, uh, the scare of, uh, of further radicalization of the of the social uh, uh, revolution say in Europe or in, in the in the in the in the Western world so that uh, I think the problem here is that uh, the, the, the the most uh, the most radical way if the most radical way is uh, Keynesianism it, the Keynesianism itself it cannot be reached in, in uh, Yes, you would say uh, progressive Europe. If I <coughs> so, if you can comment on that, maybe. Um, I mean, what? I think there are two points. First of all, I think um, Jan, as much as me, we are. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm probably more post Keynesian than a um, than a Marxist. So I think, from my perspective, it's um, consistent. But if I so, what what would be a more radical? What would you what would you quite like to see? I mean, I, I throw the question back. What what kind of uh, message would you quite like to hear? And then I will respond to your answer. Okay, I, <laughs> I don't have any solution, but I think because you know, we could at least talk about uh, um, ending the capitalist relations or something like that. Yes, and what, what do we what do we need for that? I mean, yes, we all you know we all want a revolution. We all want the workers to go, go to power, but you know. For that, yes, yeah. So either we kind of manage to mobilize them, or they have to go through an extreme cost. And you know, the, the, the interwar period was a one of extreme cost. There was a war, there was huge suffering, suffering which is uncomparable to the suffering which we have now, which bred the sea for this for the uprising. You know. And if you look at you know, if you look what's happening with the working class at the moment, um, I think the French elections, the 20% of Le Pen, is a reflection of how the working class is um, reacting at the moment. So I just, yes, okay, yes, uh, you know, we would uh, add more radical solutions, uh, solutions, it would be great to have a revolution, it would be great to have the workers rising, um, but as um, pessimistic as I am, I just don't see anything that's happened other than <laughs> just huge social costs and further suffering. Well, my point was that you have, you have at least to to aim at social revolution if you want to achieve at least Keynesianism. Galinsky says you have to be revolutionary in order to win reforms. Uh, yes, I want to, to, to come back on the one point uh, which in fact uh, is beyond Keynesians. It's, it's, it's dealing with uh, fundamental uh, human needs and uh, property ownership. And uh, I want to link what, what you said, Primoz, uh, uh, with a uh, uh, concept which is uh, more and more developed, even as a militant uh, theoretical con concept, but also a militant tool of resistance against the, the, the capitalism uh, as a world system and in the also uh, regional, local and social struggles, the notion of common, les uh, biens commun, I don't know how you translate this, common, yeah, common, 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 common way, uh, which uh, uh, can be of uh, different kinds, uh, that is uh, uh, nat natural, <laughs> like lands, the question of uh, property ownership on land for peasants which are the huge majority of the people uh, which are in a miserable situation today uh, for millions of them. Uh, the question of uh, environment linked with land, with water, 
as an issue on political and social struggle in different parts of the world. I don't want to go in there. But it, including in core developed countries, we have the question of uh, with the owner of, of the water, uh, private owners, and in increasing prices for daily life uh, on water is a key question. Uh, so, uh, and, and then uh, all those assets, those as na natural assets, which, which could, could be collec collective assets for human beings in, in general, but which need a certain kind of managing uh, in order to protect themselves in an environmental point of view against capitalist kind of uh, uh, productive orientation. But there is also all those assets, and that, that's to come to, to your point, which have been the result of human production, culture, uh, 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 health, knowledge uh, about uh, uh, health, and all uh, technical and, and, and uh, all the, the question of uh, human rights as being considered as fundamental and should be uh, separate from any kind of privatization in the uh, capitalist uh, meaning of that. Uh, and of market competition, that is education, the right to education, fundamental education. And, and those are not very abstract, those are very concrete now. Uh, and uh, the, the indigenous population, which are both fighting with even religious uh, uh, point of view, but also social and political point of view in the way to resist to multinational, in the control of natural assets and so on, are giving some <coughs> indication of uh, what could be done. And on, uh, on education, I think it's uh, uh, really a, a fundamental issue that you raise and that we should defend, uh, and, and especially against the Bologna uh, orientation at the European level, it's a concrete uh, thing. The second point that you introduced, which is absolutely fundamental, it's because the, the capitalist crisis has developed misery. And we, we were speaking of Greece. They are going towards third world situation. The people have to, to bring uh, uh, some uh, medicine when they go to a hospital, because they cannot pay for it. They don't receive it. There is no more manual for, for, for school in Greece. Hmm? So misery. And then you come back on those rights coming from the French tradition and also more. That is, against private rights, the, the gains of privatization, the human rights against misery uh, for uh, 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 subsistence, how do you say that? <laughs> subsistence. Okay. Against misery as a fundamental rights. And it's an immediate uh, point of view against the, the, the European plans today. We refuse the misery they introduce, full point. They have, so we refuse to pay with such, and, and think that the Greek people have the right to refuse this and to win fundamental uh, uh, rights uh, again, like uh, in other countries, I mean, for, uh, and also for dignity. Hmm? And the last point, to, to <coughs> come on, uh, on, on, on your uh, report, I, I appreciate a lot of so the alternative you present, and, the, the question of the idea of a regroupment mm -hmm. to threaten even the core country. Uh, we have be began to discuss this even in France, because in, in the, an alternative to Sarkozy policy would be to regroup France with South country, mm -hmm. because some elements of mm -hmm. the situation are closer mm -hmm. than to the German one, mm -hmm. in fact. Well, so, and, so what I want to say is only that like uh, it has been said in all the debates, the situation is very difficult. We, no one has the answer, the clear answer to what will be the scenario. But I agree very much with the idea that uh, some kind of relationship of force could be win, or could be won, yeah, <laughs> through regroupments, through regroup, not to be isolate. That's the point. But what kind of regroupment? Some uh, of uh, our uh, even uh, left economists in France have began to discuss also of building an, a, a monetary union more consistent with richest country. I would disagree with this. It's still reinforcing a core, core country kind of uh, orientation. Peripheral regroupment is more uh, reasonable on that point of view, but it's not the end of the, 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 the discussion. Because I would prefer to, to put forward some main slogans about K 
key uh, common rights to be defended, immediate uh, and so on, and, and look at who wants to go together in order to build something else. Mm -hmm. And not to select the country in advance. Mm -hmm. That is, put forward the program, agricultural policy, funds, European funds. You say, uh, uh, monetary, you're completely right, that there is no monetary union viable without, uh, without what you say, a fiscal transfer. Okay, a, a, f a fiscal transfer, not competition among taxes and so on. And we'll, show, we'll try and see who is willing to, to follow and go together. Yeah, no, I, sorry, no, I very much agree, and I, at least, you know, I think if, if there was a regroupment between, you know, if peripheral countries really threatened to kind of, you know, the next peripheral country would be France, you know, then they, they are have a competitive issue with Germany, and I, from the little I've talked to um, French economists, I mean, that's the, that's the concern. In terms of, yes, yeah, put a, for, put a program forward and see who joins, but we do know that ultimately those, it's the material conditions and it's the peripheral countries where the material conditions are the worst. So there would be a kind of automatic grouping as a result of that. But I very much agree with you. I'd just like to add about maybe healthcare is even a better example than education about this um, <coughs> disparity um, between development of human needs and uh, their, their uh, satisfaction under capitalism. Because, for example, in medieval times, if you had a toothache, um, you could only resort to drinking strong alcohol for a couple of days until your tooth fell out. So, uh, but now, you, you expect the immediate dentist's attention and you, you rightfully expect, so this is the one very concrete example of the development of human need for health, um, you, you expect the dentist to fix your, your tooth immediately and uh, it, will, it will be healthy again the next day. Uh, but in the public healthcare system, the dentist will combine her skill, uh, technology and uh, uh, medicine at hand to just achieve the, the best result to satisfy your human need for help. While in privatized, uh, um, in private, in privately organized or in a capitalist hospital, uh, with the exception of uh, the riches who can, who can pay for a really high quality of medical care, there is a pronounced tendency to, uh, to uh, you, uh, maybe with some reservations you could call it a rising organic, uh, um, organic composition of, of Private, private healthcare, there is a tendency to reduce the, the time and the attention of the doctor to the patient and to increase the, the level of medicine intake because medicine cuts costs and simplifies and standardizes healthcare procedure because uh, you can have, although you have a complexity of let's say symptoms and different states of diseases, but uh, uh, let's say a pill is a, a uh, it's a tendency for uh, to develop tablets that are uh, one, si uh, one size fits all solutions. So, to, to um, and to to reduce this whole involvement because it's more practical and more rational from a business management point of view uh, to just prescribe some standardized pharmaceutical uh, um, uh, products. So you have this in uh, in the history from of capitalism. You have this immense progress and explosion of medical research. Uh, all all know uh, many, many diseases were exterminated and uh, um, those who were dangerous only 100 years ago are, na are now nothing more than nuisance. And then you have this uh, very uh, increasingly with the privatization of healthcare, with this trend global of privatization, then this disparation is even more visible. There is a potential for everybody to be completely healthy, but it, it's just not realized. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I have a question for uh, Nina. Uh, this wasn't clear in your paper, at least not to me. You mentioned the formation of uh, some sort of South-South coalition of, uh, 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 of uh, nation states. But uh, do you see this as a precondition of a successful uh, default and exit strategy of individual uh, nation states, or can this be achieved later in the following years, in the, in the years following this uh, default and exit? If I understand your question right, no, I see that I see I see that as a kind of as an alternative way of defaulting and exiting. Oh, so you, you can successfully default and exit. For instance, Greece can success successfully default and exit without uh, integration in so, so, some sort of a, a South South coalition. 
No, no, I would, you know, if, if that default index works, then that it has to be as a, as a kind of okay. coalition already, not, not we first all fall apart and then okay. we kind of join again, because yeah, then, what, uh, no, 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 because that the adjustment cost would be, because, you know, I'm, I don't want to play <coughs> down the adjustment cost, it would be horrendous, so if we can avoid that by jointly um, yeah. exiting or jointly finding a way, then... Um, okay, we don't have much time, but perhaps there is need for another question. No? Okay, uh, so a few announcements. Um, uh, okay, the, the organized uh, uh, meal today is lunch and not dinner, and it's right now we will go to Cavolino, uh, uh, the place where we were in the 